my name is Beverly Brown, and I am the program consultant, a program consultant in the Office of Career and Technical Education at the Michigan Department of Education. And it is my pleasure to welcome you here today to a, spe a very special Black History Month program entitled A Conversation Spanning Decades. And so you can see to my right, we have a very distinguished panel of uh, exceptional guests, all the way from their teens up to their 80s. And so they have gone through a rigorous, pretty rigorous interview process. And first I wanna tell you a little bit about, about how they arrived actually on this stage today. Um, during the month of November and December, we cast a pretty broad net to ask for nominations for this panel. We explained that our purpose was to actually get perspectives of African American men and their K-12 experience in Michigan. So that was a prerequisite. Once we received nominations, we conducted half hour interviews by telephone which, with each of our panelists. Then we selected these gentlemen to actually serve as primary panelists. And we also have some backup panelists um, in our audience as well. So I wanna acknowledge them right now. First of all, uh, Paul Elam, if you could just stand and, and be recognized, please give him a round of applause. <laughs> and then we also have Eric Hinton, who is a backup panelist. So thank you, Eric, for being here. So, many of, many of you that work at the Department of Education are aware that we've been working on closing the academic achievement gap with a focus on African American males, and we've been doing this for quite some time now. And um, our new superintendent, Mr. Brian Whiston, who um, I'd like to introduce to you now, has also adopted that goal as a part of his top 10 and 10 initiative. And so the goal is to become one of the top 10 states in the nation in education. And so Mr. Whiston comes to us from Dearborn Public Schools. He's been here at the Michigan Department of Education for about eight months now. And he's been really on a laser focused mission to make us one of the top 10 states in the country. Um, one of the things he's done, and um, I applaud him for doing this, is bringing in all the stakeholders. And so he has had numerous meetings, his staff is traveling around the state to meet with schools, and the State Board of Education is deeply involved. And I'm happy to say that those uh, top 10 goals are posted on the MDE website if you'd like to take a look at those. And our panelists have been uh, apprised of the top 10 goals as well, or the those priorities. And so, Mr. Whiston, I'd like for you to come on up, and he will start with a welcome. Following that, we'll have our panel moderator, Henry Cade, come up, and he will begin uh, the process of interviewing our candidates. Please welcome Mr. Whiston. I just have one question. If I've been here eight months, why have I aged three or four years? <laughs> I don't know why that's happened. Just kidding. For those uh, who are employees of the Michigan Department of Education, welcome to this special Black History Month edition of our Achievement Gap Brown Bag Professional Learning Community, or PLC, and to our guests, welcome as well. MDE began these monthly brown bag luncheons in October of 2012 with the guidance from the Great Lakes Comprehensive Center at the American Institute for Research. The goal was and is to continually inform our practices with an emphasis on improving educational outcomes for our young African American males throughout schools in Michigan. Indeed, if we are to become a top 10 state in the next 10 years, we must ad address our challenges head on. To that end, we have invited the eight panelists to share their voices so that we can better understand their challenges as well as explore collaborative ways to overcome those challenges. Normally we hold these uh, brown bag luncheons in the state boardroom, but given our special panel and our large uh, distinguished audience, we needed a different venue. And even though the library forum uh, auditorium is not conducive to eating lunch, we promise to feed your mind, your spirit, and soul through thought-provoking educational accounts that span decades. Oh, and one more thing that makes this a professional learning community special is that it's the first to be streamed live and recorded for future use by the Detroit Public Television as a part of their American Graduate Series. And so 
We want to thank Caitlin Rafferty, DPTV producer, for being here, and we're happy to partner with PBIS during this exciting event. Now, as you enter the auditorium today, you could, couldn't help but notice the PowerPoint rolling behind us here. An MDE employee from the Office of Field Services, Ms. Carol Walton, was asked to create a presentation that identified 100 African-American men of note who were not athletes or entertainers. Among her notable choices was Frederick Douglass. Mr. Douglass once said that it's easier to raise up a child than it is to repair a man. The purpose of today's event is to allow us to both reflect upon and visualize the important role that K-12 plays in this Douglass philosophy. More importantly, the four objectives of this multi-generational panel event today are one, to learn how the Michigan Department of Education can intensify, intensive, okay, for some reason I don't want to say that word, for better academic outcomes for black males in future generations. Two, develop a broader and deeper understanding of the black male experience in public schools in Michigan. Three, inform policy and funding decisions based on collective voice. And four, create a more positive narrative of African American men and boys. In the spirit of tradition, I want to share with you the meeting norms for each and every achievement gap brown bag luncheon. These norms or agreements come from Glenn Singleton's book entitled Courageous Conversations About Race. And they are one, stay engaged. Two, experience some discomfort. Three, speak your truth. And four, expect and accept non-closure. And so without further ado, let me introduce our panel moderator who has spent nearly 45 years in the field of education and who currently works in the Office of Field Services here at MDE, Mr. Henry Cade. Thank you for being here and for moderating. Thank you, Superintendent Wiston. And welcome, particularly since this is Black History Month, although many of us practice black history 365 days out of the year. Uh, we wanted to share some insights with you from our distinguished group of panelists, both the alternates and our permanent individuals with us. Um, today, my first charge is to give you a collective profile on the panelists. And we'll do that with a process that has been labeled speed questioning. And you'll understand that more clearly momentarily. Secondly, I will allow each of them to give a one to two minute profile outlining who they are and why they're here. Thirdly, we interviewed them as Dr. Brown indicated and clustered many of their responses into several different categories. Uh, each man will not necessarily respond to every single category, but there'll be an opportunity for all of them to share their thoughts and their experiences. And we clustered their responses in terms of what we thought would be beneficial, both to the department and to our audience members. Um, Beverly didn't necessarily mention it, but we have representatives from various organizations and agencies. Uh, when we were originally trying to get insight into who we might want to interview, we talked with uh, intermediate school districts, we talked with regional educational service agencies and other organizations who had had some former involvement and engagement in working with African American males across the state. And as far back as four or five years ago, this was a priority for the then State Board of Education. And so we're following suit by providing this activity for you today. After we've answered some of the clusters of questions, we'll allow the panelists to do a one minute summary of any thoughts they choose to share. And then we'll provide an opportunity for the audience to pose questions, either in general or to a specific panelist. They're sitting behind their nameplates. Um, and so that happens to be the format for the day and for the afternoon. And we're gonna try and do this between now and two o'clock. I'm taking directions from my director here and my director in the back that says, you got one minute to finish this, okay? So let's move on to the speed questions. And remember, we had an opportunity to go through this earlier today, gentlemen. And so I'm going to read the question and they're simply going to raise their hand just to give you a kind of an overview of who we have in terms of our representatives today. 
So our first question is, raise your hand if most of your K-12 experience occurred here in Michigan. Okay, capture that. How many of you grew up in what some would call a bad neighborhood? Hmm. How many of you grew up in what most would consider poverty? Okay. Hmm. How many of you played organized sports in school? All right, continue. How many of you visited the library often while attending K-12? Hmm. Not as many, okay. How many of you have ever been stopped by the police? Okay. How many of you have a relative that is currently or was formerly in prison? Okay. And related to that, how many of you have been incarcerated? All right. How many of you had a teacher, a counselor, or a school administrator who genuinely cared about you? Okay, moving on. How many of you experienced racism during your K-12 experience? How many of you became a parent while in school, K-12? Okay. How many of you had friends or relatives killed as a result of violence during the time that you were in school? A few more. How many of you were hungry during a year that you attended school? How many of you earned failing grades, D's, E's, or F's while in school? Let's flip the script on that one. How many of you earned excellent grades like B's and A's while in school? How many of you felt academically challenged in school? How many of you were raised by a single parent in school? How many of you are fathers now? Okay. How many of you are married? And the last question, speed question there is, how many of you are happy to be here today to share your story? <laughs> Let me start on my far right, and I will introduce the AIDS fan, the panel's name, and then he, in this case, since they're all he's, will share something about you in terms of his profile. So, our first panelist is in his teens. Please welcome Trayvondre Evans. And he's given me permission to call him Trey. So go ahead, Trey. What would you like to say about yourself? Good afternoon. I am Trevon J. Evans, a 16-year-old junior at Saginaw High School. I am the drum major of the Saginaw High School's Mighty Marching Trojan Band, the vice president of the Saginaw High School's Teen Advisory Council, and the secretary of the Gamma Kappa Kudos, a youth group under the national sorority of Phi Delta Kappa Incorporated. I am number six of my junior class at Saginaw High School with a cumulative GPA of 3.5. I am known as Mr. Saginaw High School by Coach Donald Durrett, and I am a member of Zion Missionary Baptist Church, and I also believe academics versus athletics. All right, thank you, Trey. <laughs> Panelist two is in his 20s. Please welcome Demarcus English. Marcus English, I'm a father, I'm a son. I went to Saginaw High School, currently enrolled at Dorsey for a pharmacy technician. So. That good, all right, fine, we're moving on. <laughs> Panelist number three, 30 something, Chris Sane. Good afternoon everybody, my name is Chris Sane Jr. Uh, I am an educator, author, speaker, and activist. 
um, CEO and founder of Grand City Sports, a community-driven nonprofit organization uh, committed to influencing today's youth. We target at-risk youth by emphasizing education through sports. Um, I'm a product of Grand Rapids Public Schools. I graduated from Ottawa Hills High School. I am the vice president of the NAACP in Grand Rapids. I also am currently on a 100 school urban, uh, t urban school tour, uh, making sure that our students in the school systems uh, see someone that they can identify with that not only looks like them, but that can relate to where they've been. All right. <laughs> Panelist four, 40 something. His name is Greg White. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Gregory James White. I'm a Detroit native. I attended Detroit public schools my whole life, neighborhood schools. Um, I was born to a teen mother at 15. I had a son or a daughter at 16 myself. But after leaving high school, I got my bachelor's of education degree at the University of Michigan, earned my master's of education degree at Harvard, and returned to Detroit to become a teacher in the Detroit public school system. Uh, after a career in the Detroit public school system, I spent 10 years in corporate America working for Fortune 150 companies. I spent three years working for the federal government at the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. At present, I'm finishing my Ph.D. in education policy here at Michigan State University. I think some of the things I bring to today's panel is when I heard those questions, I recognize that most of the risk, fa risk factors that we associate with underperformance are the ones that I embodied and embraced throughout my life. And yet the outcomes are completely different. So I look forward to sharing. All right, thank you, sir. <laughs> Our next two panelists are both in their fabulous 50s. Let me start first <laughs> with Daryl Jennings. Good afternoon, my name is Daryl Jennings. I'm a uh, student, I was a uh, former student at the Detroit Public School System. I attended Oakland, Oakman Elementary School Actually, it was uh, K through uh, nine back then. Uh, Henry Ford High School, and I went to Wayne State, and I've got a, a BA in mass communications. And I've been working in uh, radio and TV since 1984. Uh, I currently work as a uh, part-time uh, board op at uh, CBS Radio, and I own my own uh, production company called Out of the Box Productions. All right, thank you very much. <laughs> Our next panelist, also in his fabulous 50s, Reggie Lagrand. Good afternoon. So I moved to Battle Creek when we were about three years old. We had lost my father in the Vietnam War, at which point my mother had family in Battle Creek and we uh, settled there. Went th through the Battle Creek public school systems. Uh, after I graduated from high school in 1979, I went to Olivet College and Western Michigan University where I got my psychology degree, bachelor's, and master's in social work. Uh, during that time, I worked at the juvenile detention uh, facility in Calhoun County, as well as worked for Battle Creek Public Schools for about 15 years. I had an opportunity to go back to be the director at the juvenile detention facility, and I did that for about three years before taking a job with the uh, W.K. Kellogg Foundation, which aligned with my belief that all children can thrive. I think what's significant about the choice of going from juvenile detention back to uh, public education and back was the fact that I saw a lot of great kids being locked up. And it just took time and some attention to see them be successful. And so when I went back to the school system, when I went into the school system, it was with the opportunity to try to stop that from happening. And then my choice to go back and run the facility is because I wanted people to think like me, that kids in detention, they're not throwaway. Kids in detention, you know, we might be their last hope at changing their lives and turning their lives around so that they can end up being on a panel like this one day. Thank you. Okay. Panelist seven in his 60s, like me, Gil Bidman. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Gilbert Bidman, also known as Gil. I am a, I'm married. My wife is here with me, supporting me today. I'm a father, a grandfather. I am an ordained minister. I am a jazz recording artist. I own a record label as well as a recording studio. My education was uh, done at the Detroit Public Schools and as well as the Flint Public Schools. I attended Mock Community College, Oakland Community College, University of Michigan Flint, and Berkeley College of Music Online. 
I would like to thank Dr. Brown and the selection committee for choosing me to be a part of this today, and I applaud the Michigan Department of Education for hosting this session. Thank you. All right, now. <laughs> Panelist seven, celebrating his 70s, Dr. Ray Giss. Good afternoon. That, that age is creeping up, isn't that? <laughs> <laughs> From down there my, to here. <laughs> my name is Dr. Raymond Gist. I was born in Arkansas, and uh, when I was about age four, my family moved to Flint, Michigan in search of um, better circumstances and more finances, quite frankly. I went through K through 12, uh, all in Flint, uh, Fairview Elementary School, uh, Lowell Junior High School, and Flint Northern High School. I w continued from there to uh, Flint Junior College, is what it was called then, it's Mott Community College now, for two years. And I was accepted into dental school at the University of Michigan. After I completed my, and got my uh, degree in dentistry, I went to the Air Force for two years as a captain, returned to Flint, and I got into organized dentistry, and I've been in organized dentistry now since I graduated. I was 23 years old then, and um, you heard what, how old I am now. <laughs> <laughs> I am um, first African-American president of my local general, uh, dental society, which is Genesee District, the first African-American president of the Michigan Dental Association, and the first African-American president of the American Dental Association. And <laughs> It involved a lot of travel, and it's given me the opportunity to demonstrate that, as I tell my mentees, that whatever your dream is, you can accomplish it. And um, that's been my story, and uh, I'm here to share, and I thank you for having me. All right, good. thank you very much. <laughs> and last but not least, our most seasoned panelist. <laughs> in his 80s, Fred Porter. Good afternoon. I guess probably the reason I was selected because there's very few of us around <laughs> <laughs> to choose from. <laughs> I was born and raised in Lansing, Michigan. I attended the Lansing School District, graduated from Sexton High School. I graduated also from Michigan State University. I worked 20 plus years for the auto industry, which was very, very, very lonely, because I was about the only black around. After that, I came to work for the Lansing School District about 15 years. I still belong to an organization, several organizations that try to mentor young boys, <coughs> even today. It's a very difficult thing to do. They need more mentors. Thank you so much. <laughs> All right. So from the speed questions with the raising of the hands and the one to two minute bios, you have at least a glimpse into the lives of our distinguished panelists. At this point in time, we'd like to move into the clusters and or categories of some of the questions based upon the responses that we felt would be important for you to hear uh, as a part of the screening process to arrive at our nine panelists. And the first category is teaching and learning, the environment, the milieu, if you please. Uh, before I go to individuals, and we're going to rotate among the members based upon their responses in our interviews, let me share this with you. Author Alice Walker once noted that one should <coughs> respect the difficulty of lessons learned because it sharpens the intellect over time. It has also been suggested that the number one predictor of student achievement, achievement is the mere belief by the teacher that the child can succeed. So we want to start off by exploring some of the expectations around teaching and learning in your respective schools. Um, Reggie, I'm going to start with you. Uh, because you shared with us in the interview that uh, there was an attempt to have you placed in special education, uh, but your mom was not having that. Can you illuminate <laughs> that for us? 
Yes, uh, I'd also like to take it as an opportunity to tie back to something I missed in my bio, which is at the Kellogg Foundation, I work in community engagement and leadership as a program officer. And one of the things that we see as key to community engagement is parent engagement in the school. And so when I was in school, I remember that, uh, you know, teachers had a high expectation. They had the expectation that we were there to learn. The challenge was I was hyperactive. And so there were times when I, you know, my desk was most of the time by the teacher's desk. <laughs> not, not because I was the star student either, but because I, she felt that that high touch, close contact might make a difference. You know, at some point they had conversations with my mother about the need to maybe test me for special education or look at medication. And she said, no, deal with him. You know, and it was through that engagement that, you know, they began to work with me. And what I can recall is that there were some teachers that dealt with me, um, and there were some teachers that dealt with me, but they took patience, they had patience, they were caring. You know, they built that relationship with me. There was a teacher I can recall named Crystal Rucker who was in middle school. Um, Crystal and sports were one of the things that turned me around. Crystal dealt with me, but dealt with me with a loving hand, and I always knew that we had a, uh, I always knew she cared about me. So I think that's what was significant, is you can challenge a student, you can push them, but as long as you, you know, as long as they know you care about them, I think that makes a tremendous difference. Thank you. Daryl, um, in our conversations, you shared your experiences at uh, Oakman, which was a school in Detroit, mm -hmm. uh, for the orthopedically impaired students. Exactly. But you said there were extremely high expectations, not only there, but that there were high expectations when you transitioned into one of the high schools that was not designed for that population. Yeah, even though most of the, uh, actually the entire uh, student body was uh, physically or mentally challenged, uh, we were expected to maintain the same standards by which any other school in the city uh, expected. And uh, when we went from um, the orthopedic school, which was Oakman, to high school, my, I went to uh, Henry Ford, uh, they made the transition smooth because they provided us uh, with a counselor who was very knowledgeable about what went on uh, during our elementary school education and uh, he uh, enabled us to acclimate ourselves to the uh, quote unquote normal school environment in Henry Ford. You know, one of the things you also mentioned, which in our rehearsal I didn't bring up, you suggested that perhaps corporal punishment should be brought back and there ought to be uniforms. Yeah, I think uh, corporal punishment, I mean, it's been a while since I've been in school. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but, I'm getting the impression that children nowadays don't fear any, any repercussions from their misbehaving and simply putting them in the corner is not gonna do anything. Okay. Uh, corporal punishment back when I was going to school mm -hmm. worked, and believe it or not, me going to an orthopedic school, it's unheard of now to, to discipline somebody with a disability. Correct. But back then it happened. Okay, all right, thank you for sharing that. Trey. <laughs> um, you mentioned earlier in our conversations uh, not only the role of a teacher is important, but occasionally the substitute can play a role. Can you illuminate for the audience what you were thinking in terms of substitutes in the teaching and learning environment? Yes, as we all expect, our teachers have great expectations for us, but what happens when the teacher isn't there? The subs are put in place, but often too many times we find ourselves getting subs that have a negative mindset of the school based on the media's perspective of us and different cultures talking about the school in general. So too many times we have subs that come in with the negative um, aspect of the school and the students. So they come in with a bad mindset and once they get there, they don't like the students. So often I find myself and my friends asking the subs, hey, do you, do you like Saginaw High? Some answers are no, some answers are yes, and some are like, hey, I'm just here. So too many times we find ourselves getting subs that dislike the children and dislike the school. So I feel that we, we, we need to get subs that actually care about the school and actually have a background about the school and not just somebody who's going off a of media perspective. Thank you for sharing that. Um, earlier, uh, we heard that uh, Reggie's mom was not going to allow him to be placed in special ed and that the teachers just had to get used to him. Um, DeMarcus, you indicated that you actually had been classified in special ed. Can you illuminate or share with us for that, please? Yes, when I was in school, I was the 
the kid that couldn't sit still, who couldn't keep his mouth shut, who couldn't keep his hands off of stuff, who always liked to get in stuff. And that like classified me as a special education because I wasn't following directions, didn't do my work when the teacher told me to do my work. But I was a good student, but <laughs> that's why they classified me, because I couldn't sit still. I still got the problem today, but I know how to cope with it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you know, like, how I feel like with that, it, I don't see nothing wrong with it. It's just people got a different way of learning and how to do stuff. So when you classify somebody as a special education, you got to think that kids is mean. And, you know, if other kids know you're in a special education, then you get teased, you get bragged, you know, you get talked about a lot. So, you know, I just deal with it. And, hey, you know, you tease me ain't going to stop my learning. All right. Yeah. I shared uh, with the panelists early that uh, my first meaningful contract was in special education as a teacher for Detroit Public Schools. And at that time, the nomenclature for special ed students um, was either educable, mentally retarded, socially maladjusted, emotionally disturbed. Sometimes a name can lead a connotation that the person picks up. And so although we've moved forward, oh, plus we were all housed in the basement of the school next to the Boina room. So times have changed. There's mainstreaming. But we still, as you'll hear momentarily, have a disproportionate number of African-American males placed in special education. And that has to change. Moving on. Gil, you experienced some high expectations, and I don't recall if it was your own expectations or the teaching and learning environment that you found yourself in. It was a combination of the two. Um, I have always li liked learning and loved to learn, reading and studying, and I to this day still do so. And I had teachers that expected the same, you know, as any good teacher would expect their students to be, you know, attentive in school, do their homework and all of that. And we had teachers at the school I attended at Flint Northwestern that were engaged. Um, I had teachers of various races. And um, they took an interest in you. And so the, that made a difference to me. It's not only the expectation, but the teacher involvement really makes a difference. Now, Greg, in our conversations early on, you indicated that um, you almost were self-taught to some extent, uh, that the encyclopedia was something at home that was expected to be utilized, and that you had a job as a newspaper delivery boy, and you read the newspaper. So you kind of self-taught yourself to some extent. I'll, I'll clarify that. Um, in reference to the encyclopedia, there was a series of books, uh, and one of the central characters was Encyclopedia Brown. And through the adventures of Encyclopedia Brown, I became immersed in, in literature, reading, writing, and creativity. The paper route was one of the most developmental experiences of my young life in ways that I never really appreciated until I was older. Number one, when you have to deliver a paper every day, that builds resiliency that you cannot be taught in any other way. When you have to do something every single day under whatever circumstances prevail, that's something that never leaves you. Uh, number two, I used to deliver the news and the free press. The free press needed to be delivered by 7 or 7.30 in the morning. That meant I needed to get up early enough to deliver the papers and get to school on time. Later on in life, by the time I got to college, I didn't need an alarm clock. I was up with the sun. And I, I re remain in those habits today, Sunday to Sunday. And then lastly, I think one of the most important lessons was the fact that when you're nine or 10 years old, you can't force adults to pay you your money, <laughs> but you want your money. So that experience allowed me to become very skillful with my vocabulary. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. Uh, Chris. <laughs> During the interview process, one of the things that emerged in terms of our conversation was a belief that um, not achieving is a norm and that mediocrity is acceptable in many, many places. Was that just in your early experiences or does that come forward into today's experiences? 
Absolutely, it was it was relevant then and it's relevant now. Not achieving okay. has become the norm among our students, especially our black students, and too many of them accept being mediocre in the academic and the learning environments. And so, and if it's okay with you, I'd like to talk to you guys in the same vein that I talk to directly to students, not only in the state of Michigan, but around the country with. And what I tell them is that there is nothing that these teachers are teaching that you can't learn. And I'll say that again, there's nothing that they are teaching that we can't learn. And so that lets me know that on a lot of levels, we're not applying ourselves. Too often times we are reminded of what we'll never be. Um, students cannot be what they cannot see. And so I, I firmly believe that um, they need to see individuals like this panel, but that looks like them, that can not only give them hope, but let them know that they can be more. Okay. I'm not, I'm not all the way finished yet. I, only thing I was gonna say, I, I often ask, um, especially when I'm talking to educators and, and, and teachers, what do you see when you look at your students? Because that's, that's so key, that's so huge. Do you see, do you see a CEO? Do you see a, a Harvard graduate? Do you see an educator or author? Or, or do you see prison? When you look at your students, do you see failure? Or do you see um, laziness or a dropout? It's so key on what, as the instructor, what they see when they look at our students. And so not achieving has become the norm, but it's a variety of factors that plays into that. Okay, so we've looked at the teaching and learning environment, and we've only hit the tip of the iceberg, given the time framework that we have to work within. So I now want to shift to teachers themselves. And I think we had an agreement that we were going to try not to use names unless it was <laughs> something very, very positive. Is that right, Ms. Directress? Okay. So, but before we jump into that, let me read this. For one thing we know for sure, okay, that schools around the country and in Michigan are dominated by feminine energy. Research by Lewis and Tolson revealed that black males make up less than 2% of the teacher workforce in America. So using that as a, a springboard, um, we'd like to get your thoughts on what the teaching staff was like in terms of the characterization when you were, er when you were in school. And Greg, let me start with you. Uh, you shared with us a story about um, an early elementary experience when you were asked to read. Uh, I think it was a group of predominantly girls in the group. Uh, and that uh, you felt put upon because the teacher felt you were not reading with sufficient emotion and or intensity. <laughs> she shall remain nameless, but um, you know, when, when, I, when I grew up, you still stratify students according to their ability levels, and largely the high-performing reading groups were heavily comprised, if not exclusively comprised, of girls. And as a boy, you don't want to play with girls, you want to play with your guy friends. So I'm in this group and I read a passage and she stops me mid-sentence, Gregory, that's not how you do it. <laughs> you know, and she, she um, reinforces that I should read with more emotion and more feeling such that people could feel like they were in my stories. And it, as I reflected upon that, there are a couple things that I think about with that feminine situation. Number one, as a young male, I was segregated from my friends. You don't perform better when you're unhappy about where you're placed. So I think that educators could be a, more, be a bit more conscious of that and be a bit more creative about how you lift achievement. Two, I didn't feel that Miss M uh, had a certain kind of femininity, femininity, but she did inspire me to have high standards and perform at a high level. So I think those are good considerations. Outstanding. Um, Trey, you indicated, and again, um, you are the youngest member on the panel and currently in school. And you've indicated uh, in our conversations that sometimes there's a feeling that only half the teachers truly care and some care. Can you elaborate on that for us? Yes. Um, I find myself in class sometimes and the teachers reflect on the senior class before the senior class that just graduated. So they often say, oh, that senior class was lazy, oh, that senior class could have did better, but they only cared for the moment. They only cared for the moment that they were in school. 
But one example of a teacher that actually does, that I feel actually does care, her name is Miss Janine Codlin. And I feel that she, she cares very much because beyond her teacher guidelines, she goes far and beyond. And when the students are actually graduated, she still does recommendations. She still does, um, she still gets some scholarships while they're in college and things like that. So I feel that teachers only care, some teachers, some teachers only care for the moment. And once it's all done and over with, they have no more to do with you. But I think it is some positive teachers out there. Okay. Now, Daryl, you had shared with us earlier that you did have a, a homeroom teacher who really kept you focused. Yeah. However, uh, since you're in the media world now, you were into the media world then. Uh, <laughs> but the lessons didn't seem to tap into the skill set that you needed. Yeah, actually, I didn't really focus on the media until I was well into college. But um, I had a uh, counselor who, again, was familiar with the uh, challenges that uh, individuals with disabilities dealt with. And uh, I learned shortly before, or actually uh, after I had applied at a number of colleges, mm -hmm. uh, that my grades weren't quite up to par in order to be accepted. So I had to, um, well, my counselor uh, saw that I was having trouble. Troubles, okay. And he mentioned uh, a, a program called Project 350, which was a uh, program that Wayne State University had at the time. And it basically um, acclimated students uh, who were in high school to um, to the college lifestyle and I took courses like you know refresher courses in English and math and they also taught you uh, study habits and uh, I was a little concerned that I didn't really find out about that program totally until you know it was almost too late and by that time uh, Mr. Balker did, did step in and, and uh, provided me with that information. One of the things that I didn't share with the panel um, in the 60s, when I was at Wayne State University, mm -hmm. I was on a scholarship with the forerunner to Project 350. Mm -hmm. It's called the Higher Education Opportunities Committee. Mm -hmm. There were 10 of us that were pulled out of Detroit Public Schools. They had full scholarships at Wayne State University. I think eight of the 10 of us actually graduated on time. Mm -hmm. So I'm glad that what we did paved the way well, for thank you. Thank you. Okay, <laughs> moving on, because I know we have a time framework here. Um, uh, this next one, it's sort of related to what we just talked about. Gil, you had shared with us that the notion that teachers should tailor their lessons to the learning styles of the students before them. Yes, I'm not sure what the curriculum in the schools are today, but I thought, you know, with each of us being individual, and we learn individually, we learn differently, that if there was a way we could take the same lesson and, and make it where a, the student could understand it as opposed to expecting every student to understand the same lesson the same way. So some students learn by auditory means, some learn by visual means and other methods. So I'm not sure how feasible that would be, but if there was a way to do that, I think that would be most helpful to the student. And also, um, if that's not feasible, then maybe we could uh, make the, the lessons that you're teaching more apl applicable to their lives. Uh, my being a minister, I've learned that in preaching and teaching the word that I have to make it uh, applicable and relevant to the people today. So I think that if we could do that with our lessons, how th the student can apply what they're learning to their lives, I think it would really be a benefit to them as well as to the, the uh, teachers. All right, thank you. Now, and believe it or not, audience, we are gonna get to the other members on the panel. We're not ignoring them, it's just the way the questions and responses have been phrased thus far. Um, before we leave this section though, Chris, you had shared with us um, the learning style that you had in relation to music and, and music videos that they almost became your teacher, uh, but that sometimes that media can be very demoralizing in terms of its depictment of African American males. Um, and yet you went on to say that everybody can't be a LeBron James but you can be somebody. Yes, the media oftentimes perpetuates negative stereotypes of specifically African-American males. And um, I, I had some great teachers, and I'll go on record to say that, and if they're watching, they know who they are. But the truth and the fact of the matter is that too often today, the music and the music videos uh, are raising our children, our, our ch children's best teachers, and for me, I went to school and played football at MSU, and I earned my bachelor's and master's degree 
by the time I was 24 years old. And one reason why that's significant is because I come from an environment that said guys like myself will be dead or in jail by 25. And I, I, I mentioned in my introduction um, about the 100 school tour that I do. Well, it really started off as 10 schools. And I hit New York, I hit some of the bigger cities, and I go into the schools and I, I, I wanna, I ask for the most challenging students in every school that I visit. And part of why I do that is because everybody has ADHD until Chris Sane shows up. And it's, it, it amazes me how they are able to focus when you put somebody in front of them that they can really relate to. And so it was 10 schools originally, but one young man pulled me to the side and he was a, he was a little younger than Trey over here. He said, he said, Mr. Chris, thanks for coming to our school and thanks for being young and being swaggy and talking to us the way you do. He said, he said but you're the first black person that our school has ever brought in to speak to us. And I talked to the whole school. And so I said, man, you know what? If this young man feels like that, I wonder how many other people and how many other students have never seen someone uh, my age, my, my, my youthfulness that, that could come in there and talk on their level and, and whatever they need to hear. Um, and so it was important for me to, I, the t I understand what the, what the media is doing, but it's important for me to go in there and make sure that, you know what, you might not be LeBron, like I said, but you can be a Chris saying, you can give back, you can go around and inspire somebody, you can give hope. And so for me, the teachers, there were some that was helpful, but nowadays, man, the, the music is some of their greatest teachers. All right, now, let's uh, shift to a different category. We've looked at the teaching and learning environment. We've looked at teachers. Again, tip of the iceberg. Another key individual within K-12, K-14, K-20 uh, is that person who may be in the guidance department or maybe a counselor. Uh, let me just share something with you in relationship to MDE. The, the Michigan Department of Education has placed an emphasis on career and college readiness. Uh, the Michigan College Access Network has established a goal of 40% college completion in the state by the year 2025. 60%? Okay, I couldn't read you right now. I'm sorry. All right. Um, indeed, this adequate guidance counseling plays a major role if you're going to embark upon that post-secondary environment, a career, or maybe even the military. So let's talk just a little bit about your counseling experiences while in school. And let me just start with you, DeMarcus, because you said you had a number of encounters with a counselor in high school in particular, uh, but I'd like the audience to hear why you had those particular encounters. Uh, mainly the reason why I had them encounters is because like I said, I couldn't sit still. I always needed somebody to talk to. The teacher thought it would be better if I go talk to the counselor. Or, or just be a random incident where somebody said, oh, look at him, then it, or you know, then it just flipped. Then I definitely had to go see the counselor. <laughs> Probably get suspended. So yeah. many of your experiences were in relation to your behavior. Yes. Uh, maybe less so in terms of guidance, in terms of direction that you might pursue. The only time when the counselor like really guided me is when, when I had my son, and that's when I really had to put on a thinking hammer, and like I can't keep doing this. You know, he helped me like what well, I'm going to do with myself. I'm going to keep going with school, or I'm just going to find a job, or you know, because my son needs somebody to look up to. Gotcha. Okay. Um, Greg, you indicated that uh, you had almost no memory of engagement with a counselor. That's true. Um, you know, when I was asked the question, I realized that I had never thought about my counselors. And I'm always asked, well, if you didn't have this strong foundation, how did you lead the life that you led? Well, going to college for me was partly out of anger. You know, when I was at Finney High, number one, Finney High is not the kind of school where a lot of people were showing up to teach you to go to college, all right? There was very little college orientation, very little information about career trajectories. But what I did see were counselors having conversations with people that I thought were either A, similarly educated as myself, or B, in a lot of cases, less intelligent than I thought I was. And so being 16 and having a kid and, and 
and being in that space, I was really frustrated because I felt like they took those outside factors and put me in this box. So I applied to college out of spite, to be honest with you. Um, I applied to Michigan, Michigan State, Michigan Tech. I ended up getting accepted really quickly to Michigan and Michigan State, and I got waitlisted at the University of Michigan. But back then, we didn't have email or the internet, so I called the office every day during the summer <laughs> to see, you know, do I need to bring in another letter? Do I need another reference? What else can I do? And I literally was admitted, I want to say July 29th uh, is when I, I got the letter in the mail. So my counselors were not very helpful, but the experience itself, I mean, you, you see what happened. Okay. <laughs> I got it. I got it. <laughs> Darrell, I'm not going to come back to you because you already alluded to your experiences at Wayne State with uh, Project 350 in terms of counseling and the kinds of things that you uh, encountered there. But I would like to go to uh, Ray with uh, this next question as it pertains to counseling because you indicated in our conversations that you had extensive counseling, both internal and external, and you also were kind of goal-oriented yourself. Yes, that's, that's very yeah. true. When I was in elementary school, I really, I vocalized that I wanted to, to go into dentistry or medicine, one or the other, because um, I had seen the lifestyles of um, physicians and dentists that were somewhat close to me, but my neighborhood was so impoverished, they had to travel a little bit just to, to uh, meet and see what they were doing. And when I vocalized this, I had a lot of champions. Uh, the counselors in school, and I got support at home too, although um, many of my relatives didn't believe that uh, that was a possibility. Uh, if it was, it was very remote. But my counselors encouraged me to the point, and they also monitored my progress. They were checking my grades. Um, they were watching as I sometimes would take a step backwards. Uh, I can remember when I was having a reading experience in class, and um, the first time that it, it didn't go very well, and I was put in a different class for slower learners. So when I got the next opportunity, I read so well that they put me out of the class and moved me back again. <laughs> Actually, I, I, I was encouraged not only in elementary, but also in, in um, middle school or junior high school. I got a curriculum in junior high school for uh, science and math, and in uh, high school, I got college prep three because the counselors believed that um, I had the expertise and, and the knowledge to get things done. And I also had good counseling when I went to the communi community college that I mentioned. And it all worked out well for me. So um, yes, I, I think a good counselor, teachers that care for you will actually um, get you to realize your dreams. All right. Now, I want to bring Freddie, okay, not saving the best for last, but he has a very yeah. different uh, set of experiences. And Fred, as you share that in terms of your experiences with counselors, also let the audience know the time span and the location, because I think it has a contextual piece to it. Yes. I've been thinking a lot about my answer while I've been sitting here. My answer to the question is that I haven't relationship with the counselors. And I stayed away from them because I didn't trust them. And I'm saying one of the things that I know right now, myself and some other friends of mine, we go to the school often to counsel young men. And I'm thinking when I go to these schools and I look at the counselor, I'm saying if I didn't trust them back in 1950s, I wonder who trusts them now. They go in to talk to the counselors, and there's none of the counselors that look like them. I think in the Lansing School District, we got one female counselor that's black. And the kids that are being kicked out of school and say that they don't need to be in the school are not the ones that are being counseled. They're the black boys. They're not going to the counselors. So why don't we have somebody they can talk to? I keep asking these questions. I don't get any answers. Okay, so we've had a myriad of experiences from limited counseling to I was afraid to go to see a counselor to I had lots of opportunities to see counselors. So obviously there's an important role for counseling, for teachers, 
and of course for the teaching and learning environment. Let's shift momentarily here to behaviors. Uh, behaviors that you yourself might have exhibited or the behaviors of those around you. Now, we know that special education has been around for a very long time. I already shared with you, I started teaching it in the middle 60s. Um, but in the 70s, there was a, a little bit of a shift, a variation. And let me just share this with you. Uh, in 1975, a new category of students with perceived disabilities emerged. And trained professionals analyzed the data and then they developed a, a hypothesis in terms of why we think the student is behaving this way. However, the data then, the data now, the data probably going into the future still suggests that black males make up a disproportionate number assigned to special education. And so the question becomes, how did your behavior or how did the behavior of those around you influence you? What could have been done differently, if anything, to mitigate those behaviors so that you would have had a more positive or a continued positive experience. Let me go to Gil because Gil, you talked a little bit earlier about a dropout set of experiences. Yes, um, my situation was that I, first of all, I made the choice to drop out of school. I wasn't forced to do that or encouraged to do that as something I did by hanging around with the wrong people. And to give you some background ground on that, I come from a broken home. Um, my mother and father, we, I was born in Indiana. We moved to Detroit when my dad got a job with GM. Got laid off from GM. We uh, ended up leaving Flint, going to Detroit, where he got hired by Chrysler. While we were living in Detroit, my parents separated. So my mom was left raising seven children by herself uh, with no help financially or, or emotionally or morally or, or any sort. So she thought it best to send myself and two of my siblings to live in Arkansas with our grandparents just to kind of alleviate the, the stress of trying to take care of that many children. And so that separation caused some, some uh, family dynamics that um, I think impacted me in a negative way. Um, after returning from Arkansas back to Flint, the, my family had moved to Flint by that time, um, I began to hang around people that you know, were kind of disinterested in school, so that influenced me negatively and so I ended up doing the same thing. Uh, being, as I said earlier, I've always loved to learn, always wanted to learn, but just got with the wrong people. And I did not have the experience of with the counselors that were there to guide you and, and, and lead you down the right path, but at the same time I did not seek out the counselors as well. So I don't fault anyone but myself in terms of the choices and decisions that I made. But I think a lot of times that you know we look at students and we kind of pigeonhole them into you know, a category of they're not here to learn, and, but not knowing and understanding there may be some family dynamics going on that you're not aware of that could be causing that student to act the way that they are behaving. All right, Trey, you had indicated earlier that um, you have sort of taken the bull by the horn and decided mm -hmm. to exercise some behaviors on your own. Um, and you shared with us some school board meetings that you attended, uh, last summer and on the weekends. And then you also discussed the balance between athletics, excuse me, and academics. Share with our audience uh, some of your thoughts. Well, last year our school district was going through financial problems. So the solution that they seeked were, was to close one of the two high schools. And so our, my school was on the chopping block. And with the help of Mr. John Pugh and a few other adult leaders, we formed a group called As One, which was conducted of about seven of us. And we went to every school board meeting and we voiced our opinions to keep our school open, but not only our school, but keep both of the high schools open within the districts because either way we were gonna lose students if you close the high school. So we voiced our opinions and, and our school is still open. Both schools, both schools are still open and will continue to be open. And my philosophy about academics versus athletics, athletic competition within the two rival schools in my city are pretty heated. They're pretty heated, but it's a friendly competition. So to keep that competition the way it is, we also have academics, and you have to be academically legible to play. 
and so you have to keep a C average. So I wanted to balance those two equations. So I started a program, and it should be starting up soon. It's called the Scholarship Committee, and we will be for, we've been issued a lot of tests lately since our school is in priority status. And so for those students that do good on the test, they can enter a raffle and they can win big prizes like iPads and things like that, things that kids actually want. So the balance between academics and athletics is what I plan to keep in control. Okay, moving right next to you. DeMarcus, um, you had indicated uh, that you had experienced a number of suspensions, uh, but you also said you had a coach who helped to keep you focused. And so I'm not sure how the athletics, uh, the discipline, and all of those pieces roll into one for you. Um, I wasn't, I was too bad to be up on any sports or anything. So like with Coach Direct, he kept me, he kept me balanced, you know, kept me out of trouble. And like the person who I really want to give a thanks to is my mom, because that's, okay. that's the person you, you be behave and somebody call your house, you got to see her first, you know? <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> and you know, like, with her, you know, it's her birthday too, my bad. Shout out to mom, happy birthday. <laughs> That's yeah, what's up. Yeah, you know, so with a with a mom with a woman, as a single parent, no telling. You get a call, she will be up there halfway naked trying to whoop you and tell you to get back to right doing what you're supposed to be doing, you know. And I respect that, you know, get let you know that, you know, you need to be doing what you support what you're supposed to be doing and not what you should be doing. Okay. All right. Does that roll into your parenting role at all? What you experienced? Oh yeah, a lot. Okay, okay, <laughs> fine, fine. Greg, you had identified three things in terms of behaviors uh, that you felt the audience ought to hear, at least from your perspective in terms of moving forward in a positive manner. What were those? So, so for me, looking back on my history, my uh, educational trajectory was very inconsistent early on, and I became a better student later on. Uh, but I think that when I, when I talk to educators and, and young students, a couple of the things I think about is, number one, identifying one of the smart kids in class. You know, um, when I was a kid, the kids who were high achievers, there was some cachet to being a high achiever. There were some rewards and benefits to that. Now, I don't see that as much in our, in our schools. Uh, number two, identify a passion. You know, a lot of our students don't have very firm direction. I was one of those kids. I became a teacher because I was a junior in college and needed to declare a major, and uh, a professor said, look at your transcript. What are you good at? What do you like to do? And I added another factor, which was, how can I give back to my community? And teaching was the answer to that. So we need to give kids more experiences so they can figure out where their passions lie. And then three, I think that as students, they need to be encouraged to cultivate positive relationships with teachers. Because teachers write your letters of recommendation. They open you up to uh, different colleges and universities, different uh, occupational experiences they may have thought about or dreamed about or been exposed to themselves. You know, in, in communities of color and low SES status, we have very, very small orientations as it relates to career paths. And I think that as educators, we need to be very conscious of that and actively creating a, a viable alternative to what is now being experienced by our young people. Okay. Ray, you had indicated on a couple of occasions that you were already very goal-oriented, per se. Um, but you also indicated that you took it upon yourself to make sure that those around you knew what your goals were in terms of your behavior. Can you illuminate that a little more for us? Sure, that's very true. I, I, um, my experiences weren't all golden and, and full of roses. I did witness a lot of violence and misbehavior. Um, some of my classmates I competed with to see who could get the best grades. Others, when they would take a look at my report card with a lot of A's and B's, looked at me like I was some kind of a freak. <laughs> so it was, it, was, uh, it was a matter of one or, or the other. I did have a member of my family that um, got into drugs, and he was um, two classes ahead of me. He graduated, but did nothing. 
with, with his life. He, he passed on. That motivated, motivated me also because that's something that I did not want. I wanted to, to fulfill my goal. So that helped me out and also with uh, counseling and athletics. I did play, uh, I did run track. I played football in high school and that having to get good grades in order to maintain that level of, um, of uh, ath athletics also kept, kept me focused on what I needed to do. So all in all, uh, I did see, and some of my classmates after graduation, several of them uh, were killed because of violence and, and drugs. So before we leave behaviors, are there any other panel members who have a perspective that perhaps we've not had the opportunity to hear from you? Behaviors that you felt you should have exercised or could have exercised or those around you? Yes. I guess I'd like to share an experience. When I was um, working for the public school system, I was a uh, student support specialist counselor and the assistant principal, which meant often you got the kids who were in trouble being sent to the office. And one of my experiences was that I had this young, one young man that would come to the office on a, on a regular basis, you know, and I, I thought, that kid must hate me. You know, and I remember uh, one day his mom said, oh, Mr. LeGrand, Mr. LeGrand, we went shopping this summer for school clothes, and Chris said, he wants to have clothes just like you. Now my principal looked at me and said, really? I <laughs> <laughs> but, but what that told me was when he was in the office, He's looking. And so, you know, when, when we don't think kids are looking, they're always looking. And so we're always on that. Uh, we have to realize we're the role model that they're looking up to. Whether they're in the office for trouble or in the office for good, we have an opportunity to touch their lives in a positive way. One Anybody thing else I would, before we Go ahead. Yeah, I, I would add to that um, it's important to understand that students don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And so for a lot of teachers, uh, when I was coming through school, the ones that I can identify with and and really see that they had a vested interest in my, my academic success, uh, those are the ones I gravitated towards. It's not about the PhD, it's not about the, the letters behind your name, but me, me being able to actually see that you care. Okay, let's segue into safety uh, and support uh, because we still want to allow time for the audience members to ask their questions and we have several, several other categories. Uh, the Michigan Department of Education is currently engaged in the final year of a three-year pilot program around African-American males. Um, it's entitled the African-American Young Men of Promise Initiative, of Promise Initiative. And they have a number of research-based strategies that have been employed and deployed uh, in a variety of schools around the state and districts, et cetera. One of the research-based strategies comes from the work of Dr. Ivory Tolson, and it's centered around something that's really somewhat simple, but making intentional phone calls, positive phone calls home, supportive messages being delivered to the parents of black male children to better engage the families and to allow the males to get some positive support. Positive phone calls home. They have many, many other strategies they utilize. We're just highlighting this one. In addition to that, the notion that support has also been delivered in the form of healthy meals, because in many of our inner city or urban areas, we may or may not have fresh vegetables and groceries available, or they may be cost prohibitive and this notion of mandating an educational development plan, an educational development plan. So what role did or does safety play and how can educators improve, if at all, the safe and supportive environment settings for African-American students? And I'm gonna start with you, Reggie, because you talked a little bit about uh, having a, a big brother and maybe even the organization of big brothers. So share with us yeah. from that perspective. Uh, you know, as I think one of the things we've heard here today is about the importance of mothers and the decisions they make as our first teachers. And one of the things that my mom did, you know, having, all, you know, all of a sudden she's a single mom with three young men uh, relocating to Battle Creek was realize beyond the support she could get from her family, what other support systems were there. And so, uh, you know, I will start off with the good news is I was in the Big Brother Big Sisters program. 
and I just celebrated with my big brother last year, his 80th birthday. Um, I went to their 60th wedding. So that was a long-term relationship for me. Um, I think how it ties back to the school is I knew that if I was struggling in school or needed support, not only did I have his support and my mother's support, but I had someone else that would kind of challenge me and talk to me about that. But what was, what was uniquely different about that relationship was that we were different in every way. They were white, I was black. They were Catholic, we were Baptist. You know, they lived in a rich neighborhood, we lived in a poor neighborhood. So I think that taught me at an early age to appreciate difference and understand each other. And I remember at the, this ties back into a little bit about race conversation, that you know, at the 60th anniversary, wedding anniversary, his daughter and I, who were in the same class, finally talk, had the conversation about race you know, and how it was different. And that was a very impactful conversation, I think, for both of us. Uh, but I think the other point that I would make about my relationship with um, George and the Big Brothers Big Sisters program was that we all get to that point as teenagers where we push our parents away, we push our teachers away, we want to do it on our own. And when I pushed him away, uh, he didn't go away. I didn't know it, but he stayed around. He would come to every one of my football games. And at the end of the year when we had the, the banquet, he showed up at the door and he gave me a book. And in that book, he had highlighted my name in every article. You know, it showed that he was there at every game. And to me, that just reminds us that even when kids push back, they still want us. You know, it's not the time to walk away. And I remember having a conversation much years later with his wife, and she said that was a very hard time for him. And she said, but you know, he always, he, always, he felt you would always come back to him, and we did probably when I was in college. Uh, so I, I think for me, it's just, the, again, it underscores the relationship that we can form with people. Um, DeMarcus, you had earlier shared with us on this notion of support, um, the role that friends can play even at the bus stop on the way to school, and then becoming a parent. Uh, you also talked about trying to put a smile on your mom's face. Um, share with the audience what you told us. Uh, yes, at the bus stop, and many things can happen at the bus stop, you know. <laughs> That, that's, that's the like, let's just turn around and go home, you know. <laughs> but you know, you gotta be a bigger person and say, you can go home, you know, but I'm gonna just stay and finish school, you know. And you know, my support is my mama, you know. That's the biggest support, you know, in the world is your mother. You know, she gonna be behind you 24 seven, whatever. If you even do anything wrong, just do it again, baby, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, I love to put a smile on her face, you know. And then just to show, you know, just to show her that she really do support me, you know, so I got to make everything right and got to do it at my fullest, you know, so my son can realize what I was doing was just not just to do it, but we got to, you know, you got to do it to live it. Okay. All right. Thank you for sharing that. Um, Trey, you have mentioned several organizations uh, that you've been involved with, and I guess they do provide a variety of different support. Uh, one of those, I think you said you're the vice president or the president of the Teen Advisory Committee, and then you also mentioned something about the Mighty Marching Band. Uh, share with our audience members uh, your thoughts on that. Well, our Teen Advisory Council, which I'm the vice president of, is a organization ran through our school-based health center, which is like a mini doctor's office located in our school where kids can go and get services whenever needed. And so basically what our Teen Advisory Council does is throughout the school year, we host many different campaigns. Like each month we have a different theme, which February is teen dating, teen dating violence awareness. And so what we did was for Valentine's Day, we had the students come over to a table at lunchtime and they made Valentine's bag to give out to their Valentine. It had candy in it. And also it had brochures on how to have a healthy relationship and also different um, health, health and safety related um, statistics and facts of, um, that they can use. And so, and then tying into our band, our band has a performance every year at the Dow Event Center, which is a um, big arena hosting mainly hockey games in our city. And one specific hockey game that we get asked to come perform for is the Shocks and Saves game which is a hockey game that is in respect to people who have died or suffered from um, having heart attacks. And so my band director, her dad actually died from one. And so we get asked to come perform. And so that's another health and safety issue that we take on and we try to provide for our peers. All right, thank you. Ray, on a couple of occasions, you've mentioned your engagement with sports and that 
some of your peers were in violent situations. Um, any additional thoughts that you want to add in terms of how we can make schools safer and be supportive? Well, yes. I, I well, I would like to flip to flip the switch a little bit Go because right now I pretty much do a lot of counseling myself uh, since I've had the opportunity to travel throughout the country and and I, to several other countries. Then I've been in contact with many, many students, and um, and that includes high school students as well as college students. As a role model, I'm able to, to give them some messages that stick with them pretty well, and that is to encourage them to move forward with their dreams no matter what, no matter what kind of setbacks they have or no matter what kind of challenges they have. I always tell them that each and every one of them, just like you in this room, has a special talent, and it's up to them really to bring that talent to the surface but that capability is there. I said that you might fall while you're, while you're um, climbing that ladder, but the only way that you can fail is if you fail to get up and keep moving forward. And it's had tremendous success. I could tell by the number of phone calls that I continue to get. Uh, I've had, um, well, in its upcoming class now, the School of Dentistry, three of my mentees have been accepted. Uh, I have uh, two that are two high, um, senior students, undergraduate at the University of Michigan that will be coming to my office to shadow me and, um, and to be mentored. And I have one in there right now. So over the course of the years, um, I don't know, I can't count the number of lives that I've uh, influenced and been in contact with. And I've seen so much success that I know that the talent is there. And being supportive of it right, will thank you. help to eliminate that violence. Along those same lines that Ray just spoke to, uh, Greg, you talked uh, uh, to us about wraparound service and mental health services that could be a meaningful support for the schools of today. So I think that when we begin these conversations about safety in schools, our immediate thought is about physical safety. I think we've underrepresented the degree to which mental and emotional safety is important. There's a lot of data that demonstrates that when you are mentally or emotionally under stress, your performance decreases, whether that's in reading, writing, math, sports, almost any task. And so when I think about mental and emotional safety in our schools, we need to figure out ways where students feel that their words, their ideas, and their emotions can be surfaced without some undue burden. Because if we can't do that, then a lot of this academic achievement that we want, it will never, never surface. And these things work in tandem. A lot of the issues and challenges that our young people are dealing with are outside of their control. These are things that are larger than their individual persons have any way to impact. So what happens outside uh, happens, uh, impacts what happens inside. So my thinking is we need to figure out how do we go back to more of a community model where the school is the center of the community. You provide support ser services to the parents outside, which will deliver better students to you inside the school. Okay. Before we leave the support uh, and safety issue, um, are there any other panelists who perhaps didn't have an opportunity to share that have any thoughts on that? Well, I just Thank wanted to you. say I was, a ahead, I was a proponent, I mean, not, not only encouraging the children, but <coughs> some of the reasons that there's, there are so many distractions is because there's a lack of discipline. And I feel that the parents should uh, be disciplinarians and I'm a proponent of uh, corporal punishment. And I think we heard that earlier. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. like I was saying, and, and uh, maybe school uniforms. And uniforms. Yeah. Okay, all right, fine. Well, let's uh, shift. Um, there's a movie coming out, I believe it's coming out tomorrow, and it um, highlights the life and struggles of Jesse Owens. And I think it's entitled Race. And since Jesse Owens was indeed an African-American male, um, he probably had two elements of race that he had to deal with. And sometimes that's a, a difficult conversation to have. But let's look at race as we know it. Um, I don't necessarily agree with this, but I'm going to read it, and you make your own judgment on this. One of the most celebrated shows on television today is a show called Empire. 
It showcases a dysfunctional African-American family who have achieved monetary success and power in the music industry. However, their values may be somewhat questionable. And so when we think about race and particularly media as it depicts African-American males and others, let's explore that. And so, Daryl, you had talked a little bit about some theories on that since you're in the media field. What would you like to add, if anything, in terms of media coverage? Well, the media primarily is uh, revenue driven. So they want to um, make a profit. And if they view the destruction of a certain community as being profitable, they're going to go with uh, what makes them money. So shows like uh, Empire, I mean, it's, it's highly profitable. And that's apparently what's selling. So you'll probably see more shows like that because of its, its success. But being in uh, the media for 30 some, 30 some years, uh, and in terms of the coverage of, of the African American community, I haven't seen a lot of um, assignment editors who are African Americans. Uh -huh. A lot of them don't live in the community. Mm -hmm. So all they know is the impression they get from the media, which is, like I said before, is absolutely false. So it's, it's, a, it's a vicious vicious cycle because they, they see what they're creating and it, it goes back, you know, back to the uh, assignment editors. All they know is from what they see in the media. Okay. Trey, you had um, indicated that media obviously has an impact on you being one of the youngest members on the panel, but that you try to portray the opposite side. Can you elaborate on that for us? Yes, and I was sitting here thinking about my answer, and there's this oratorical speech that I do, and there's this, there's this part that should elaborate my answer. Black man, do you have goals besides media, sports, and clothes? I mean, this is how the media portrays you on these TV shows. So is this the real black man? Let me know. No, this is not me. But if your only understanding of a black man comes from TV, then I can understand why you might be confused about me. But that is not me at all. I am more concerned with enunciating properly, firm handshakes, eye contact, and standing tall. And I use that as a stepping stone to get me to realize that I am better than what the media portrays me to be. Gil, coming up a few years from Trey's experience, you had indicated that you, uh, at one point in time, were either on the outskirts or actively involved in a race riot situation. Yes, that is correct. Uh, the scenario is that during my junior high school years in Flint, Michigan, um, there was a lot of racial tension in this time period. This is the late 60s, uh, early 70s period, right after Dr. Martin King had Martin Luther King had been assassinated. Uh, there was a lot of teasing and taunting by uh, students of the Caucasian race, and we as students, African American students, were being bused to this school, and. We had to ride the bus with them as well, and we were outnumbered by them by significantly. And uh, but we dealt with this on a daily basis, being called names, the N-word, among other names, and just teased constantly by them. And then um, one incident in school, actually uh, had a confrontation with a student, ca Caucasian student, and it led to a fist fight, which led to a school-wide riot, which was not my intentions, but you know, that's basically what happened, and it was just me defending myself. But, and, and then there was another incident on the school bus where we would get dropped off first at our neighborhood. Uh, we lived in the projects, and so they would drop us off first, and then the Caucasian students would proceed on to their neighborhood. And this one day, um, I guess we had just had enough, and, uh, and we spilled off the bus, and, and there was a fight that broke out, and, they, and the, our students, the uh, African-American students, were being attacked even our female students. And so, you know, being one of the few males on the bus, you know, we, we just couldn't stand by and watch that happen. So that led to some ugly incidents. Kept me in the principal's office and kicked out of school quite a bit. 
got so bad to the point where uh, my principal told my younger siblings coming up behind me, oh, you're Gilbert Benman's uh, brothers and sisters, we will not have the same behavior out of you that we had out of him. So, and also, I, w I wanted to, uh, to share with you that, you know, there's a saying that sticks and stones may break my bones, but words can never hurt me. That is so not true. Uh, the Bible teaches that there's life and death in the power of the tongue. What you say to another person can impact them negatively or positively. So it's, it's very crucial how we, s we speak to one another, you know, racially, uh, different groups. We have to remember we're all human, first of all. Secondly, we are all Americans. And, and to treat another group of people differently because they don't look like you, to me, is uh, I don't understand that kind of behavior uh, or mindset at all. And a lot, I think a lot of it's just because we're not familiar with each other. We stay segregated from one another in our secluded neighborhoods and don't spend enough time with each other and really sit down and listen to each other. And that's Thank partially you. why we had you here, to have some of that conversation. Fred, um, as a segue, even though we were hearing from Gil more about the verbalized word, sometimes there can be the best intentions, uh, and it may not even be a verbalization, it may be an act per se. And you shared with us earlier uh, that an ele elementary school situation that involved a meal going to a teacher's home and photographs being taken, uh, but then there were some things that spilled out of that that may or may not have been planned. After talking about this, I've been thinking about this. One of the things that I do with friends in mentoring young boys at the high school and middle school is we try to tell the kids what they need to do to be successful. But what was really hurtful to me and to others who try to mentor these youngsters is sometimes when we're mentoring these youngsters, we might mentor until say three o'clock it's time for the schools to close. And we, if we're by the window, we look out the window and we see the teachers almost running over the kids getting out of there. And we say to ourselves and to each other, I wonder where they're going. Do most of them live in Lansing? Probably not. They probably don't even know how we feel. And this, that brings back this incident that happened to me in kindergarten. Well, we were in a kindergarten. I think we are in the third grade. The teacher, was a very nice lady and she thought she was doing something really nice but she really didn't understand the, ch the children that she was teaching so she she had a a party for us at her home which was not in Lansing it was a, out in the country it was on a Saturday she took us out to her house for a picnic and she had a really nice picnic for us we had played games the whole bit but the one thing not understanding our culture she took pictures of us eating watermelon. Now the kids didn't care one way or the other, but she thought it was a big joke. And so when she took the pictures, the next Monday when we went back to school, she put them on the bulletin board. So how do you think those kids felt or their parents felt once they saw that? They were quite upset. So maybe we need to show folks that we really care about them, we're not doing things like that and knowing what hurts people's feelings. Parents need us to say we're quite upset. I think she lasted probably another day before she was gone. Mm. Before we leave race, anybody else that's not spoken on this particular cluster or category have a comment? Go right ahead. Yes, um, mass media dramatically reinforces some of the most negative conceptions of black and brown people. And unfortunately for us, those perceptions also drive policy. I often say that uh, media, they, they, from Fox News, CNN, the whole gamut, they'll never show you images of a Trey or a Chris Sane or a Greg or a Gil. Um, images that can shape a person's destiny, can, can do so much to uh, let them know that they're not to Trey's oratorical, they're, they're not what the media say we are and portray us to be. Mm -hmm. And so I just wanted to, to add that in there. I'd, I'd like to add something very brief. I think um, sometimes when we have these race conversations, I feel like uh, people are not really sure what to do. They feel overwhelmed by the enormity of having a race conversation, especially if you're not a person of color that has to experience it. 
And so one of the things I think about is this. There's one thing to not be racist. It's another thing to be anti-racist. Anti-racism requires you to take action. It requires you to use your social, political, or economic capital to make sure that others are not being harmed or disadvantaged because of their race. It's using your privilege and your position, whether it's in a formal position or your informal relationships, to make sure that these inequities are being addressed. That's anti-racism. Trying to say that I'm not racist is a very, very passive thing. And one of the things that allows racist institutions and systemic structures to be so prevalent is because people are quiet, people are silent, people accept privilege and don't ex expect to have to give back and deal with the responsibility that that privilege comes with. So I would like to put that on the table as we leave this race conversation. All right. Okay, we only have a, a couple of uh, categories left, even though I'm getting the one minute sign, so you're gonna double check <laughs> for me, right, <laughs> in terms of that. Um, and this category is entitled Successes and Challenges, but, but here's the lead in piece to it. It says, when President Obama, and this may reflect the conversation we just had, was elected to lead the United States of America in 2008, many believed that this was the pinnacle of success for a black man. Hence, racism was no longer an excuse for failure. However, there are others that believe the current political, economic, and educational systems simply create what psychologist Dr. Umar Johnson calls illusions of inclusion. Illusions of inclusion. And so as we talk about your successes, and some of them have, and challenges, have already been discussed. Um, Ray, you had some goals very early on in relationship to this, and you had support. Um, you talk about mentoring others. Is there anything else that you would add on to the role that you play in mentoring? Uh, yes, uh, not only mentoring, but um, when you mentioned illusions of inclusion, I have to disagree because actually I was in somewhat of a similar situation when I was elected to each one of those offices okay. because uh, of the majority white uh, um, um, Organization delegates mm -hmm. voted for me to get an office. As an example, for the American Dental Association, there were 470 delegates. There were not any more than nine African Americans that were in that delegation, and I won it handily. Uh, at least 60, between 65 and 75 percent of the vote. So it's not an illusion uh, because I'm recruited a lot more back to do things for not only um, the American Dental Association, but uh, organized industry in general. And uh, also, I sit on the board of the University of Michigan Alumni Association and I have an opportunity to work with young students that uh, not only uh, enroll in the college, but to supervise and ment mentor those also. I really think that if there were, if opportunities were, were made more available or if our students, potential students, were aware of the opportunities, then um, that, that idea of, um, of an illusion would completely disappear because uh, we, are wanted, and I can, I can um, verify that at any particular time. And if we are willing, and if we are able, and if we want to get involved, just like our president got involved, as a matter of fact, he said he would run again if, if it were legal, then um, that illusion is uh, just not factual as far as I'm concerned. Okay, that's another perspective, and we, that's why we try to have a diversified panel to have those kinds of experiences shared. We're being pushed in terms of our time, so is there anyone on the panel who would like to, in a minute or two, share a success or a challenge that would be a benefit for our audience to hear? Gil, you talked about your pursuing the ministry and, and music. I'm assuming that was a, had both challenges and successes. Uh, absolutely. Um, having gone from being a dropout, I you know, 
push myself on after realizing that, you know, that wouldn't get me anywhere to, you know, pursue college education and so on and so forth. And the one constant in my life that I had was music, and music kind of sustained me through all the different phases of my life. And it's a God-given gift, and I've been able to utilize that gift and create music. And as I said, I have my own record company and, and uh, recording studio, and I have music that's out available online. But music is something that speaks to the heart and the soul of every person. And I think music is a source that we can use to heal if we can use it in the right way. The young man spoke on my right about mu music being used negatively today, but it also has positive impact. And being called into the ministry, God has allowed me to be able to utilize the gifts that he's given me in many different ways. And, and I feel that a ministry is powerful in itself because as you minister to others, you are being ministered to, to as well. Okay, as we transition, I just wanted to give Fred an opportunity to speak to your work with the HBCUs yeah. and how that's been a success for you and for those with whom you work. Well, I'll quickly talk about HBCU. Most of us know what that means. Historical, well, maybe some don't. Historical black colleges and universities. Thank you. For the last 25 years, myself and my friend, Mr. Island, have been putting on a tour of HBCUs. That means we go to the, we have like seven different routes that we go to. We take youngsters to visit schools. We want youngsters in the Lansing area to know that there's a place you can go to to get an education other than Michigan State or Michigan. <laughs> We've got colleges in that our ancestors have created that are really anxious for you to come down and see them. The only problem we've had in the past is that we can't get too many boys to go. We take 40 youngsters on the tour. In 25 years, the most boys we've ever had go with us is 10. Mm -hmm. Usually it's about six. And we talk to them constantly about going on the tour with us. We even have organizations that will pay for them to go. We just can't get them to go. We even try to entice them to go talking about all the pretty girls that are there. <laughs> <laughs> and unfortunately, we can't get the boys to go. And I think it's critical that information gets out to the schools that we need boys to go as well as the girls. Okay. As we ship, thank you so much for that, to the last little piece that deals with MDE. Because across the conversation, I think things have emerged that the Michigan Department of Ed might want to consider. Uh, but just to tap into it, just uh, for a moment or two, um, Reggie, you had in indicated earlier on in our conversations uh, something about foundational partnerships. Is that something that the Michigan Department of Education might consider? And if so, how would that be helpful to the African American male or anybody <coughs> else for that matter? Yes, I think across the state you have several foundations that, you know, the work that we're talking about here today, young men and boys of color, the work we talk about in terms of race, education, are important to a lot of foundations. That's the common good that we're working towards. I think foundations can serve as more than just money, though. They can serve as a resource, a connector, and an opportunity to share the learnings that they've learned from that bigger picture view across the country at different, in different communities. You know, for example, one of the things that's important to the work at the foundation, this last conversation about race, that's, that's, that's you know, I would say the special sauce that we have as a foundation is that's key to everything that we do. And one of the initiatives that we have in, in Mississippi and New Orleans focus on young men and boys of color. And so I think that's important. So I think that's an, an area where we can share some learnings. Another piece is our work around America Healing. And so I think if you were to go to the website, there's a lot of things on the education related. There's an American Healing, there's a resource guide there that you can click in and, and create your own uh, resource book for yourself um, in terms of you know, work what you want to know about the importance of racial equity and healing. And I think the last piece that we recognize in that space from a foundational point of view is the importance of allies. You know, we have to work together to get this work done. And so uh, we, we do it internally. You know, we, we are an anti-racist organization. We're led by, you know, great leadership that focuses on that and holds us accountable to that. And at our board level, at our, at our leadership level, we all go through ongoing training about, you know, holding true to that mission and that vision for children. Okay. As we wrap this up, is there any burning issue that the Michigan Department of Education might consider? One, one thing I'll add, and I'll be quick because I know we pressed for <coughs> time, is that there's often time a, a heavy focus on outcomes. And as an educator, I understand that very, very well. Um, but too often times we, we forget to focus on the need. And it's important that we don't let our students get expelled from life 
68% of our boys are born without a father. And that's very, very huge, and that plays a very huge role in their academic success or lack of at times. 85% of men in prison report not knowing, not having, or not touching their father. At Grambus Community College, we have a, um, a leadership development class for black male students uh, specifically. And the college reached out to me, and, and, and I'll just make it plain for you guys, that black students at our college were statistical leaders in every category of failure. And so what we try to do is, is change that narrative by putting individuals around them that can help them succeed in college, learn how to study, learn how to do the things that they need to do to navigate college as first-time generation students. Um, coming from a K-12 system that may not have always prepared them for the rigors of college. And so um, it's very important that um, Michigan Department of Education and, and people that's involved in this work understand the needs of our students. All right, thank you very much. Now we've heard a lot from our panelists. Um, we want to give you an opportunity to perhaps pose a question either generally or specifically to one of the young gentlemen. Uh, and we have one or two individuals who are moving around with microphones. There's a, okay, there's one on your left, on your <laughs> right, I should say. And let us know if you're addressing it in general or if you're addressing it to a particular panel member. Yeah, you should never give me a microphone. <laughs> Come on, Raj. Come on. <laughs> you gotta go. First of all, I want to say thank you all for coming. Uh, I found your words very inspirational. You spoke a lot about um, how our children need to see our faces. But seeing you myself, it's, it inspires me. And it's given me energy. Um, and selfishly, I do want to give a shout out to two natives from Flint. I'm also a Flint native. Beat your buccaneer. But it's okay that you went to Flint school. <laughs> but my question really is this. Um, there's a lot of power in this room right now. A lot of power in black men. How do we take that power? And how do we make that and spread that out into our communities collectively? I hear a lot of things that we're doing separately. But I'm always curious about how we do that collectively. I was one of those students like uh, DeMarcus. I, I was feeling you, bruh. I was totally feeling you. And I, I was thinking about it. We didn't have that when I was coming up. So how do we take all of this and all of this here and spread that out into the communities collectively? And I'm all for it. If you need me, you call me. I'm there with you. And I see Greg writing. I know he thinking. I know how he <laughs> is. So. so let's let him answer that question. How do we make it more collective? So, so when I think about large scale change um, in any respect, I think number one, you start where you are with the people you know. I think too often, the first thing we think about is who can we go to? And I say go to your mirror because you know where you're at. And you know the people that listen to you and respect you. I think the other thing is we have to think about what are the systemic barriers to prevent us from doing what we want? What are the pipeline issues that we have or don't have? Have we identified a pipeline or not? You know, so for me, one thing I think about is this. If we wanted more uh, black educators, why aren't we doing something to early, through, through early identify, identification incentive, and incentives to figure out how we get young boys interested in teaching young boys that are like themselves? You know, no one knows the community better than the people who live in the community. And we know that these young people don't have crystallized notions of their career paths. So they're ripe for the taking. I know of no programs that do that kind of thing. I think we need to look within and see what talents we have within young people because adults do a lot of talking to adults about what they want out of children and don't converse with children, all right? So you can't have me be successful when you are not even having a conversation with me. Okay, so I think that you start at the individual level, you look to the systems that produce the outcomes or don't produce the outcomes you want, and you figure out how do we create or improve the pipeline to the outcomes we want. Uh, my name is Robert McAllister. I'm assistant principal at a middle early college in Flint, Michigan. We focus on taking at-risk students and giving them that opportunity at college. And, and a lot of them are coming in with low uh, skills and actually achieving uh, associate's degrees, leaving with associate's degrees at a minimum 15 college credits as well as more. My, my statement is, is 
the kind of the battle that we're facing, I think that even when I was growing up, I, I graduated from Carmen Ainsworth, not Beach or Big Nine. <laughs> um, and and um, the focus is when you are a black male and you are doing the things that you are doing in school, you are considered white or you are doing what white people are doing. And you are almost uh, pushed down by your own culture. And I feel my, my frustration with the black culture is that there is no support there. I mean, as much as you're out here trying to give that support, there's a small percentage that are actually out here helping to support their fellow student, fellow friend, and instead of saying, hey, man, you should be going to school. Let's make sure we're going to class. They're like, hey, let's go skip. Let's go out here. Let's get these shoes. Let's get this money, you know, things like that. And where, like, what are your guys' opinion uh, about that type of um, reality that these kids are seeing? Because they're not, they, I can sit back and I'm, and I'm supporting them as much as I possibly can when their own friends and their own family at times are not even supporting their education, pulling them out to babysit their son and daughter when they're supposed to be in school, sitting here and telling them that they need to work and be in that, in that um, pipeline of, of just work and not really care about the education through that value. I started this panel discussion by telling you guys that not achieving has become the norm. And I'll repeat that one more time. In the, in the black community, among black students, not achieving has become the norm. One thing I say to any student that I'm in front of, if you can let them know that society expects them to not achieve, society expects them to fail. Um, but like I mentioned, it, being statistical leaders in every category of, uh, category of failure, for me, what that did was motivated me to defy the odds. And so I didn't come from the best background, I didn't come from the best family, but I was determined to be more than what society expected and predicted of African American males. And so as a result, I told you, I went on and earned my bachelor's and master's degree by the time I was 24. I don't have any mentors, I don't have many, many men, regardless of how accomplished I am, reaching back to past up a time, I don't have a silver spoon, I don't have connections in the workplace. And so I had to go get that, meaning that paper. I had to go get the things to open the door for me to now be one of the speakers around the country that everybody is calling, do, write all these books and do all these wonderful things. But unless a student has it within himself, meaning we say the inner city is designed to kill your vision. Okay, I'm gonna say that one more time because you guys need to be taking this stuff in. The inner city is designed to kill your vision. And when you can remove hope from a young man, not achieving becomes the norm. Okay, and so the flip side of that is making sure that you remain hopeful. You give them something to uh, grab a hold to. For me, I told you sports was that. I dominated in football and basketball in high school. That was my ticket out of the inner city. I went on to Michigan State, and I didn't have this type of career that led to a professional career, but I was able to be exposed to more. I heard somebody mention about exposure. I was able to be exposed to some things, and I said, you know what? God purposed me to do some awesome things, and, and I, I had more than one gift. I, I, football just not it for me, and so I was intentional about figuring out what those were and then giving them back to the community. We have a question in the back. On can, side. can I respond to that? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. All right. right here. So, you know, one of, one of the reasons I ended up getting a, a, a PhD was because I wrestled with a lot of these things as an individual, as somebody who came from these challenging circumstances, who heard these negative statements by people that looked like me and people who didn't look like me, for people who came from my area and people who didn't come from my area. And so one of the things I do as a critical thinker is think about what does the data say? All right. Does my personal viewpoint find support in rigorously defined data collection? All right. So a couple things that never sits well with me, and I, I usually end up disagreeing with folks on. Number one, education is acting white. All right. John Ogbu and uh, I forget her first name, but last name is Fordham. They came up with this theory that acting white is related to education and people of color don't do well in academic circumstances because it is attributed to acting white. 
All right, what the data shows is that is false, okay? That is a stereotype. It is consistently accepted and reproduced and not challenged. Why? Because our empirical reality as individuals may provide minute examples that reinforce it, but data does not, okay? So that's one part. Number two, black culture is pathological. You know, I, heard things, I hear things a lot about the culture of black people, the culture of poor people, the culture of poverty. There is no substance to these things, ladies and gentlemen. I encourage you to leave this place and find whatever library or internet or computer that works best for you and dig into the data, okay? The, another thing, what are the antecedents to what we see when we engage young people, all right? What came before that kid walked into your class, walked into your building, or walked out of your class, or walked out of your building? What came before that? Because I've never met a child that decided to be born and raise him or herself, all right? A couple other things, and I'll be real quick, okay, all right? You I, <laughs> I got another question back here. Take your time. Our, our focus is wrong. I hear these narratives about our students embracing a lack of achievement. No, if you grow up poor, broke, without mentors, without consistent utilities, with the food insecurity, and you are still alive and coming every day, you have succeeded at the greatest game on earth. And my final point, inner city. Inner city has the birthplace. Inner city is the birthplace of a lot of things. Inner city is where most of our black, brown, and poor children are congregated. I submit to you that the inner city is the birthplace of ingenuity and inventiveness, okay? If we want this city, this state, this country to be better tomorrow, we will look at our inner cities and, if, and expect to find assets because they're there. Yes. I was raised to get an education, to get a job, to get out of this city, to get out of this school, to get out of this neighborhood. This is your ticket out. No, no, no. This is what we need to do. We need to tell our kids to get round trip tickets, all right? You go out there and get that education. Go out there and get that training. And then you bring your behind back to make this what it should have been when you was here. All right, Greg. Hello. Question in the back. Greg, we appreciate you today. Wow. <laughs> I don't know what I'm I need sorry, to say now. I'm sorry, this is something I'm passionate about. We understand, we appreciate you, and I just want to thank the panel for being here with the Michigan Department of Education. We really appreciate you being here today. I'd like to say to the panel, you have the superintendent of, of Michigan schools right before you. What words would you like to leave with him to carry on this legacy of this achievement gap with African American men? Anybody can speak, but Greg, um, go. <laughs> 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 Okay, let's let Greg go ahead. I guess it's pretty much understood that the place to find African American males majoring in education is not in this area. So why aren't we going out trying to find African American males to come back here and teach our African American males here in Lansing and in Detroit and Flint? Why don't we go get them where they are? Mm -hmm. At the HBCUs. Mm -hmm. I see them all the time. If you really want them, Go get them down there. We've done it in the past. The reason we get black teachers in Lansing after I left is because a guy went down there with an application for the teachers for jobs in Lansing, Michigan, signed them up, and they came back to Lansing. We there need we to go. do the same thing right now. Mm -hmm. There we go. We got another perspective from Ray, and then we have to transition. Go ahead. Yeah, one last thing. Uh, actually, building self confidence is, is my mantra. And I've got a daughter that's an educator. She taught in the Flint school systems. What she said was lacking. She also taught in Detroit. What was lacking were in the facilities, the inadequate facilities for teaching. She had to buy too many things on her own. She, if she had everything available that she needed in order to teach her students, then she could build self-confidence and make male and females move forward in the school system. And to me, starting with facilities, and um, mentoring would take care of this problem if we can just expand it enough to reach all of our black males. Reggie, the final word before I go. Yeah, yeah just real quick, and I think it, it, it builds on everything. One of the themes that's been running through is just the importance of parents. And I think we touched on it, but one of the things I remember way back when, when I was in social work, and I never forgot what the teacher said, no one ever gave birth to a child and said, I don't, I, and, and wakes up every day and say, I want to be a bad parent. 
So I think we have to look at what are those ways to engage the parents and know what's going on in their lives because you know they may not come to the school for different reasons, but I think we have to understand what is their story, what's their narrative, as opposed to saying they're just a bad parent. Can we have a rousing round of applause? Give Henry, our moderator, a big round of applause. <laughs> At this moment, I am so proud of the men at this table. They were so excited that they had an opportunity to come and share their voices with you. I got email saying, oh, I can't wait till the date. I got an email from one of the backup people saying, oh, I hope that one of the panelists gets sick so I can take their place. <laughs> <laughs> they were so excited. And so I thank you for listening to their voices today. And our goal here was not to really provide the secret sauce to fixing the problems that plague the educational system for African-American males. But I want to remind you of our four goals today, and I want you to keep this in mind as you complete your evaluations that are inside of your packets. Number one, our goal was to learn how the Michigan Department of Education can intentionally foster better academic outcomes for black males in future generations. Number two, our goal was to develop a deeper and broader understanding of the black male experience in public schools in Michigan. Number three, we sought to inform policy and funding decisions based on a seldom heard collective voice. And number four, our goal, and I think we've accomplished this one, create a more positive narrative of African American men and boys. We have added a positive narrative for this population by placing in front of you some powerful examples of contributing members to society who happen to be black males. What we know from their testimonies is that they are, they are several, there are several things in our system that have worked, and there are some things that not, have not worked so well. Teen parenting services are working for people like Mr. English. We've heard how the system has served Mr. Jennings, and full disclosure, he is my biological brother. Uh, Mr. Jennings, um, <laughs> <laughs> we know how uh, Daryl has been served well with his smooth transition from Oakland, uh, Oakland Orthopedic School to Henry Ford High School, so that has worked for him. We've heard about the important role that nonprofit organizations have played for this population, like Big Brothers and Big Sisters for Mr. Legrand, for Reggie. And we've heard that cheerleaders come in all shapes, sizes, and colors, and at all levels for black men. So I ask you this. Are you one of those cheerleaders? Through their lens today, we have also learned that there are psychological, social, environmental, and policy issues that compound the challenges for African American men. They want to learn, they want to be empowered, and they want to succeed. And most of all, they want to contribute to society. In fact, we really need them to contribute to society. Our, ec our economic well-being depends on it. After all, we don't want to mimic other communities in the nation who are now struggling with monumental challenges, including protests and violence. We need to get ahead of what might be. We can change the narrative now. And so stop and ask yourself, what myths or biases have you now questioned, that you've questioned, or have, have you set aside? In August of last year, Many of you ha may have seen the Associated Press headline that said, ACT says college exam scores are stagnant. The article pointed out how African American students lagged behind significantly. Two months ago, the Detroit Free Press ran this headline, Michigan's black students lag behind the nation. And I also read last year an article in Philanthropy News Digest that reported that the US Foundation's funding and support of programs and organizations working to improve life outcomes for, for African American males totaled $64 million in 2012. That was up from $40 million in 2011. So this trend has climbed upward 
ever since 2003, yet we still read headlines like the ones that I just cited. It's important to note, though, that people are really trying to change the situation. For example, right here at the Michigan Department of Education, we have studied and reported the data until we have turned blue in the face. The State Board of Education has adopted a policy on suspensions and expulsions to help thwart the school to prison pipeline. We've promoted safe and supportive schools through grants to urban districts. We fought for and secured more than $65 million in early childhood funding. And guess what else? The Detroit News recently reported that there are more programs in Detroit than in any other city in the nation that are designed to help black men and boys succeed. So my question to you today is what can we do differently? And who is the we? How can we leverage our resources and work collaboratively, as Raja posed the question earlier, to improve outcomes for this population who we know has enormous potential? How can we connect the dots to make sure that these men are not footnotes to a tragic story? How do we let them know, really know that someone cares? Michigan has more than 280,000 African American students, or 18% of the total population of about 1.5 million students. Some might argue that this percentage is too small to dedicate thought to. On the contrary, this percentage is too significant to ignore. It is statistically significant if you consider what's happened in cities like Chicago and Ferguson. So, allow me to offer eight deliberate ways in which we might consider altering these outcomes. The first two, I have to give credit to Scott Heisler from Ypsilanti, uh, one of my um, early middle college colleagues in the field. He offered this suggestion. What if we awarded highly qualified teachers an extra year toward retirement if they successfully taught in an urban school district where poverty is highly concentrated and African American students are disenfranchised? What if? The second suggestion that Scott offered, he said, what if we allocated more future funding to high schools where it costs more to educate students and just maintain the funding to elementary schools where it's not as costly to educate a child? Number three, what if we deliberately created a regular line item in the state school aid budget for new school upgrades and repairs in districts with concentrated poverty? How might that change the environment where students are mandated to go to school every day. Number four, what if all the programs with evidence of success for African American males consolidated their resources and multiplied their impact? Number five, what if every educator were trained in cultural proficiency and exercised an effective instructional model for African American students? We would never have a watermelon pitcher on anybody's bulletin board ever again if everybody understood cultural proficiency. Number six, what if all well-meaning teachers raise their expectations for all African-American male students? Number seven, what if we all began to reward and praise academic performance, not merely measured by standardized tests, as much as we celebrate the athletic performance of African-American males? And number eight, what if we banned worksheets in urban schools? And I've seen many worksheets being used in urban schools. I used to monitor priority schools. Um, a couple of years ago. What if we banned these workshops and instead fostered critical thinking? We've heard that from um, Dr. White down here. We've heard fostering critical thinking is important as well as real world problem solving, Socratic questioning, and leadership opportunities. How might this mitigate or eliminate the culture of mediocrity that Chris Sane talked about earlier? I offer these eight questions to complement the eight generations of insights into how we might purposefully, intentionally reshape K-12 education to better serve African American male students for future generations. I would also like to make everyone aware of a special Saturday event that will complement this panel extremely well. It's taking place at Michigan State University um, as a follow-up to this discussion today, and it's called Making Relationships Work a Summit on Black Male Academic Success and Inclusion. It's gonna take place on Saturday, March the 19th, from eight o'clock until six o'clock, inside of Erickson Hall at the College of Education. 
Again, I just want to remind you to reach inside of your program booklet and complete the evaluation form before you leave. And uh, upon turning in your evaluation, we'll give you a free cookie. <laughs> um, and finally, I want to thank so many people that have helped to make this day a reality. Um, and so I want to thank, first of all, this magnificent panel um, who agreed to take time off work, take time off school. Somebody missed a test today, I think, or they had to get a test yesterday so they could come today, so we appreciate that. Um, I also want to thank the Achievement Gap Brown Bag Professional Learning Community Committee for working so hard. Um, they include Dr. Teresa Saunders, Dr. Uh, Mr. John Brooks, and Henry Cade, and the four of us pretty much did the interviews for all of the panelists um, during November and December. I also want to thank Dr. Shireen Tabrizi and Latrice Royale from the Office of Field Services, Ms. Cheryl Bailey from Great Lakes Comprehensive Center for her continued dedication and support. A thank you to the three directors at, Mich at the uh, MDE who afforded us the space and resources to make this event possible. My boss, Patty Cantu, and thanks to uh, Joanne Mahoney who gave me the time to do this work, and uh, Dr. Mike Radke from the Office of Field Services, Ms. Linda Forward, she gave us lots of money to print these beautiful um, booklets that you see and everything. And then others who have supported this event through nominations, technical support, moral support include Carol Walton who did the wonderful PowerPoint that you saw that will be posted on the MDE website. So if you want those 100 African American men, you can find that on the website as well as the state library website. I also want to thank Leanne Reyes who is my assistant in the Office of Career and Technical Education. I'm sorry, I have so many people to thank. Francis Lake um, who sent you the emails repeatedly bugging you about this day. Dr. Jill Griffin, Brandy Archer, Luana Shelton. Uh, Luana's doing research back there, taking notes. Um, and also thanks to Ben Williams in the Office of Government and Public Affairs who has arranged for a free lunch sponsor for our panelists and their guests immediately following this. And we're gonna have a deeper discussion spanning decades for the next hour after all you all leave. Um, <laughs> So um, I, I just want to especially thank the friends at Detroit Public Television for broadcasting this live. This um, whole event, the two hour event, will be available on their website and uh, we have your email addresses so we can send the link out to you and if you want to share it with other people, you can do so. So again, let's give our panelists one more big round of applause. And a shout out to my honey. Thank you, Willie, for your support, too. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Have a good day. This program is part of American Graduate. Let's make it happen. A public media initiative made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. <laughs>